Hey, welcome back to Morning Footy. Here's a look at the Copa America weekend results so far. Argentina and Canada kick things off. The reigning champs get a 2-0 win in that matchup. The United States kicked off their group stage last night, 2-0 over Bolivia, and Uruguay-Panama ended in a 3-1 scoreline, the other matchup in Group C. And our very own Jenny Chu was on the ground at that game as we now welcome her into the show. Jenny, great to see you. How was the game Hi, last Allie. night? What were your big takeaways, the atmosphere? Tell us. It was a good atmosphere. You know, there were definitely more Uruguayan fans than there were Panamanian fans at the match, but still impressive here in Miami. Um, it was very humid. I have to say that the stadium kind of locks in the humidity, and I was sweating so much that my face was stinging. Just, you know, random fact, if you're going to a match, just be ready for the humidity. Um, in terms of the match itself, uh, I was expecting a good tactical match considering Thomas Christensen and Marcelo Bielsa. I know not that many people would put them in the same conversation as good tacticians, but Thomas Christensen has been trying to you know, transform this Panamanian team. And if we remember, they did beat the United States in World Cup qualifying in the first leg in Panama um, and has since continued to grow this team. And I think that they came into this tournament understanding that they were one of the weaker sides coming into it, but they were going to be fearless. And that's what we saw from them in this Uruguay match. Mind you, this is an Uruguay squad that is stacked with talent and they have Marcelo Bielsa as the tactician. Um, there were many opportunities to score goals for Uruguay, but they did not put them away. Darwin Nunez missing a few of them. And they end up getting an absolute golazo in the 16th minute, which was beautiful to see. But um, there was a stretch in the second half that Panama really dominated, and Marcelo Bielsa talks about it in his press conference about how disappointed he was to go from dominating to just completely being dominated for the first 15, 20 minutes of the second half. So that kind of gave hope for Panama um, in sometimes, and then they end up scoring a consolation goal at the very end there. But uh, overall, a good, a good match. It really was kind of both ways um, in a way that maybe a lot of people didn't expect, if you don't know, um, that Panama has been working to improve and, and the fact that they don't have the kind of players that Uruguay has. Jenny, it's been a minute since you've been on Morning Footy, so welcome back to the show. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so much has been talked about Uruguay being one of the favorites of this tournament. Did you see any vulnerabilities in watching them play? Did you, were you hyped about them? Were you excited about the way that they played? Or do you think that the U.S. could target a certain um, part of the field against Uruguay? You know what, if you were to take those first 15, 20 minutes of the second half that Panama was really in the game and really dominated Uruguay, if I'm the United States, I'm taking that as a point to go ahead and study and figure out what was going on. Like I mentioned, Marcelo Bielsa not happy about that. But if you look at Para, uh, sorry, Uruguay, they press so hard for 90 minutes that it's not sustainable through six matches, right? So the fact that the U.S.'s schedule is uh, Bolivia, and then Panama, and then Uruguay could be to the benefit of the United States, just kind of working into and growing into matches here. Uh, I think that that could be a positive. I really did go into this tournament thinking Uruguay is by far the best team in this group. And I'm not saying that they're not, right? I'm saying that through this performance, you do see potential openings like studying that 15, 20 minutes. I'm not saying I did it yet, Charlie. I know that you and Tony will go ahead and do that for me, but there is an opportunity there that maybe they're not as dominant as we expected them to be. Jenny, when you, when you watch this team, one thing that was clear, I thought last night, I'm just curious from a live reaction, when you, when you look at it on TV, it's different. This is a very Marcelo Bielsa side. It's all about transition in both moments, when you win the ball and then when you lose the ball. It's 100 miles an hour. Do you think the U.S., in those moments you're talking about, can get, the, get at this Uruguay side in transition going forward? Because the one thing we do do, fairly well when we have opportunities is get out on the counter. That's interesting. I think that what I'm mentioning there is that it's not sustainable because they do press so hard and then they defend so hard as well. Um, Tony, it's a great point. I don't know whether I would see it as much of a positive on the United States as you're seeing. I think that the, the speed in which Uruguay does it is much faster than we see the United States do it. I did see, I mean, you were talking about a, a match against Bolivia that really that's an opponent that really we cannot compare to an Uruguay side, but there is a moment when Bolivia goes on the attack in the United States match that the U.S. is, um, <laughs> looks like I'm doing a thumbs up here, but I'm really just trying to point. Um, the U.S.'s transition into defense was not impressive at all against a Bolivia side. So if I'm Uruguay, I'm looking at this, and mind you, Marcelo Bielsa, understanding the tactical mind and the genius that he is, he's going to look at that and say, we can absolutely exploit that. Um, I would say that the U.S. is getting better at transitions. I wouldn't say that that was their strength 
always. Um, for Uruguay, I think that the speed in which they transition and the fact that they are expected to high press for such a long period of time and then to to be 100 miles an hour both ways and they're coming from a 10 day camp. Um, only one of the, the big uh, matches for nail against Mexico. I, I don't know. I think that it's going to be hard to sustain come game three. And maybe that's when you get them in that transition that you're mentioning there, Tony, the fact that they have had to high press for so long. Uh, Jenny, let's talk about the U.S.'s next uh, competitor, and that's going to be Panama, who I think impressed a few people. I think people thought they were going to come in and get completely worked over by it's Uruguay. Like Bolivia, right? hmm? it's similar to like a Bolivia. Yeah. No, but obviously a higher level. Against Uruguay, I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's talk about what you saw from them, because I thought Coco Carasquilla, I thought there were moments where he was absolutely electric in that midfield, just absolutely dribbling past people, turning uh, players. But it, do it doesn't seem like they have the quality overall to put it together. But as a team, they play very tough. They do play very tough. And Thomas Christensen at halftime, right? Mind you, it's only 1-0 at this point. And this is uh, a matchup that you would expect Uruguay to be maybe dominating, especially with the chances that they created in the first 20 minutes of this match. Um, Coco Carasquilla is someone that we've come to expect to have great performances for Panama. We are used to seeing him kind of dominate that midfield and just be electric when he has the ball at his feet. But you're without Anibal Godoy in this tournament. I mean, five days out going into Copa America, he is no longer allowed to, not allowed to, excuse me. Um, he's ruled out with a thigh injury. So that's a big miss for Panama. But you're talking about a team that, did well when you think about what you're up against, right? You're thinking about an Uruguay with Darwin Nunez who plays for Liverpool and um, Araujo who plays for Barcelona. And these are top level teams against a Panama team that doesn't have that level of players or the pedigree of players that you're up against. And they really didn't, you know, fall in a way that you're thinking Panama is a completely different um, level and look down upon them in the same way that we did against Bolivia, right? And when you're looking at the U.S. game, you're thinking Bolivia didn't even create an opportunity, really. Um, there was no chance that they were going to beat the United States and they were going to be beat by Panama and Uruguay, potentially. Panama didn't give you that impression, and I think that that's Thomas Christensen's doing. I have been a big fan of him. I know that in World Cup qualifiers, I talked about how I talked to taxi drivers and just different people around, and they are such a big fan of what he brings to the team and the fact that he has a tactical game plan. It is more of a long-term plan, right? Trying to um, qualify for the 2026 World Cup is the biggest thing for them. So they're not here to win the tournament. They're here to kind of show growth and continue to get reps. And I was impressed with them, Alexis, and Coco Carasquilla is the center point of that team. Yeah, <clears throat> I would have said Coco Carasquillo was a ghost in that first half. He looked lost. But, um, it, you know, goes back to Thomas Christensen and, and the way that he sets up the team, that the counterattack was was really something to get after uh, Uruguay with Luis uh, Jose Fajardo was just bombing in behind in the channels. and If only he was clinical. Only. If only he could, <laughs> he could put his shots on target. And both sides were in clinical, but... Hey, Jenny, I want to rewind to Saturday, Mexico 1-0 over Jamaica. What were some of your key takeaways from that performance for the Mexican side? You know, I was incredibly disappointed with uh, Santi Jimenez not getting on the ball more. I think that that's someone that you talk about, oh, he scored so many goals in the Eredivisie. You want to see him do this for the national team, but we haven't really seen that from him. Um, you're talking about a, a change of generation. You're talking about the no Memo Ochoa, uh, no Chucky Lozano, no Raul Jimenez, no Henry Marte. All of these players that, that you're a little bit more used to seeing, I guess. Um, I guess Henry Marte, not that much. But um, you now have this... New wave of players. Uh, Quinones is coming in as a naturalized player. He's only had like six um, matches with the Mexican national team. And then you have Santi Jimenez starting in that nine position. Memote coming off of the bench in this match. Uh, obviously, Edson Alvarez gets injured early in the match. And that's their captain. That's their centerpiece that plays for West Ham. And then they do get this goal. But Luis Romo is who comes in for Edson Alvarez. And I think that that's the one positive point that you can take from this match is that Luis Romo came in and didn't skip a beat. Edson Alvarez is a big miss, but then Luis Romo has plenty of experience in that position as well. He puts the assist for the goal that ultimately Gerardo Artiega puts in with a great shot. I was not incredibly impressed with Mexico. I think that what we've been asking from the Mexican national team and Jaime Lozano is for the team to have more ideas, to be clear ideas, um, and to really dominate these matches that they should be dominating, but they didn't. Uh, Jamaica put a good showing as well, and not to forget about them. You're going to expect more from Mexico, though, and there's going to be questions. There has not been the same fan base that there has been in prior years for this Mexican team, just because people have kind of lost faith. So many changes in coaches, so many um, 
just bad performances, uh, lackluster effort. Uh, I know, Charlie, you care a lot about, you know, when people wear the crest and how much they, you know, show on the field. And that's something that's been lacking on the Mexican side.